Good morning, church. Good morning. Welcome to worship. Anybody have any fun last night? Ah, yeah. uh, it was a great night. We certainly had fun. We especially enjoyed uh, having our friends Gary and Joyce Mason in our home for the evening. You're going to get the privilege of hearing Reverend Dr. Gary Mason share a message in today's service. Uh, but last night, as we were visiting after dinner, we got to introduce them to American football. We had a really great Seriously. time. Seriously, <laughs> Gary didn't. They didn't know how you scored it. What were they? What? What is What's the first? What's a down? And, yeah, and yeah. So we had a great time. So, but uh, but we are really glad that you are here. Uh, whether you are worshiping with us in person or online, welcome. If this is your first time with us, we want to offer a special word of greeting to you and tell you how glad we are that you are our guest today. Please let us know that you have worshipped with us. You can do that a couple of different ways. You can use the QR codes that you see on the screen or in your bulletin. That will take you to an easy online version of the Connect card. If you're worshiping with us online, there's a link that'll drop in the comments that you can use to get you there. Uh, one of the things that you'll find there is an opportunity to share a prayer concern. And if there's something that you would like for us to be praying about this week, uh, it would be our privilege to do so. And so you can share that there. If you want to use the physical cards, if you're here in person, uh, in the back of the chairs, you'll see some cards and you can take one of those out, use it, and then drop it in the offering boxes after worship today. Again, really glad that you are here. We want to tell you something that's coming up a week from today, and we're starting a new worship series called What Does the Bible Say About? You all have asked for some teaching on different subjects, and so we're going to do four weeks. The first week is What Does the Bible Say About Itself? And we'll be sharing and, and, and offering and giving to our third graders the, their Bibles, and so we're really excited about that next week. And then for the next three weeks, What Does the Bible Say About Poverty? What does the Bible say about homosexuality? And what does the Bible say about racism? Um, some, some provocative topics in some ways, and we're looking forward to digging into Scripture. Uh, what does God say to us about those things through Scripture? So we hope you'll be there for that next four-week series. Um, and as we worship together, we come into the house of God, giving thanks for the goodness of God and living in that goodness all of our lives. We come seeking to be more faithful as we follow in God's ways, seeking to live lives of uh, healing and reconciliation and to offer that for the world. And so as we prepare to go out into the world afterwards, we come together to receive that strength and, um, and learn more about the ways of Jesus Christ. And so I say to you this morning as we worship together, welcome home. It's great to be home. Now let me invite you to stand up and say hello to someone near you. Please introduce yourself if you don't know them. Reach across the aisle. Say good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. As you're finding your way back to your seat, would you please remain standing and let's join together in singing our opening hymn.
me invite you to be seated, and I'll invite us into a time of prayer, Uh, and I want to take a moment as we begin this morning and just create silent space where you can offer your own prayers. Uh, Perhaps you came in this morning with something that was burdening you, or you have a family member or a friend who is ill or struggling, and uh, you would uh, appreciate just having a moment to pray for them. And so, we, uh, we will take that time together, and in that moment, we know that God hears all of our collective prayers, uh, and then I'll offer a prayer for us together. So let's, let's pray. God of grace and God of glory, on your people pour your power. Empower us to live as your church, a particular and curious people that are called together as strangers made to be one so that our witness might point the world to you. We pray that even as we worship this morning, we would learn more about what it means for us to be followers of Christ, that our ears would be opened and our hearts attuned to your way, your will, and to your calling on our lives, both the lives that each one of us live individually out in the world and the life that we share as church as a community called to pave a very different way in the world. So we pray that your spirit will move among us in these next moments and that we will offer ourselves fully to you. And as we prepare to do that, O God, we lift our voices, joining them in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I want to take a moment this morning to tell you about our mission focus for today. Every week we have an opportunity uh, to share gifts in addition to our regular tithes and offerings, uh, gifts that can support work that extends out in our community, and in this case, out into the world. Uh, Gary Mason, our guest preacher for this morning, is the founder of a nonprofit organization called Rethinking Conflict. Uh, And you can best learn about that uh, through hearing it from Gary himself. And so we've got a short video for you to take a look at. um, And then a little bit later in the service, Gary will be coming to share a message with us. So take a look at the video now. My name is uh, Gary Mason, and I'm standing in the rooftop garden of the Skenos Project, which was a 30 million US dollar project, post-conflict urban village shared space. I'm a Methodist clergy person and I spent almost 30 years working in the inner city of Belfast, uh, particularly in the area of peace building, conflict transformation and reconciliation. I spent most of my ministry never any more than about 100 to 200 meters from what we call peace lines, which are primarily security type barriers separating Catholics and Protestants in this still very segregated city. I've worked in both North, South, East and West Belfast and have been involved in a number of different social justice projects as a clergy person, uh, bringing theology and psychology into the kind of remit and fragmentation of the inner city. I've been able to set up my own small NGO called Rethinking Conflict, which has allowed me to work locally, which I'm still doing, but also nationally and internationally. 
Uh, now I spent my time working between the Irish context, uh, doing some work in the United States, and also doing some work in the Middle East. And really looking at lessons from the Irish peace process, some of their relevance within a religious framework, a political framework, a psychological framework, and some other trouble spots within the world. Amen. <clears throat> a reminder that our very lives can become vital channels of God's peace in the world. Um, one of the other ways we offer ourselves is through our tithes and our offerings, our gifts that make a difference through the ministries of the church. Uh, you see a couple of ways that you can give on the screen, QR codes that are also in your bulletin. Uh, if you're online with us again, there's a link that you can go to to make a gift today. Uh, and if you'd like to make a gift toward Rethinking Conflict, please just remember to note it that way specifically. Uh, and if you'd like to give in person, there are uh, envelopes in the back of the chair uh, racks that you can use for that. Would you pray with me over today's offerings? Loving God, we give you thanks uh, for the gift of being your church and for the opportunities that it presents to us to share ourselves fully through our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Take what we offer this morning and use it for your purposes as we see your kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.
three readings from the prophet Isaiah. What should I think about all your sacrifices, says the Lord? I'm fed up with entirely burned offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I don't want the blood of bulls, lambs, and goats. When you come to appear before me, who asked this from you? this trampling of my temple's courts. Wash, be clean, remove your ugly deeds from my sight, put an end to such evil, learn to do good, seek justice, help the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak compassionately to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her compulsory service has ended, that her penalty has been paid, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice is crying out, clear the Lord's way in the desert. Make a level highway in the wilderness for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, and every mountain and hill will be flattened. Uneven ground will become level, and rough terrain a valley plain. The Lord's glory will appear. And all humanity will see it together. The Lord's mouth has commanded it. Look, I am creating a new heaven and a new earth. The past events won't be remembered. They won't come to mind. Be glad and rejoice forever in what I'm creating because I'm creating Jerusalem as a joy and her people as a source of gladness. They will build houses and live in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They won't build for others to live in nor plant for others to eat. Like the days of a tree will be the days of my people. My chosen will make full use of their handiwork. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's nice to be back with you in Trinity. Uh, This uh, lady in the second row was asking me had I spoken here before and I said yeah but with COVID it actually seems like a lifetime ago in 2019 but it's good to be back with you here in Trinity and thanks to the readers there for reading those texts. The very ancient texts those written literally thousands and thousands of millennia ago. But the thing about those ancient texts I think that all of us have to wrestle with is, what is their applicability within our sophisticated uh, 21st century world? In the Irish context where I grew up, for those of us who were religious leaders during our 30-year internal civil war, which primarily was about land, identity, and religion, we most certainly had to ask ourselves questions as religious leaders, uh, where people were almost killing in the name of God, in the name of land, and in the name of political identity. We had to ask ourselves questions like, can these ancient texts spill into the public square and actually make a difference? The Anglican clergy person, uh, John Stott, who died a few years ago at the age of 92, uh, talks about Methodist theology like a bird with two wings. And John Stott suggests if you kind of lop off one of those wings, the bird obviously collapses. 
The two wings of Methodist theology are personal holiness and social holiness. And I sometimes wonder in our kind of 21st century entertainment oriented world, are a lot of churches simply not more than entertainment centers where people come on a Sunday morning to get a high. And we forget about social holiness and it doesn't seem to spill into the public square. I'm sure both Marissa and Catherine and Steve invariably in pastoral visits are asked the question that I guess I was asked hundreds, hundreds of times. Gary, why is the world such a mess? And kind of tongue in cheek, I often used to suggest back to them, hopefully it was a kind of cheeky prophetic sense of humor. I said, I think it's our fault. Because the church is not out there, it's primarily in here. And if you think that analogy is wrong, Jesus talks about uh, rubbing salt into the carcass of a putrefying society. And it's very difficult to do that if the majority of our Christian existence is spent within the rarefied atmosphere of church. Uh, Let me give you a little pop quiz. Anyone here like Motown? Come on, some of you do. Just me, I'm the only person in church that likes Motown. There must be more than me. Motown, okay, Motown, okay. What do you want me to, want me to preach with an Irish accent or an American accent? I can do an American accent if you want, but I'll just stick to my Irish. So let me, uh, so a song going back to the 60s when it was first uh, muted, when this old world is getting me down, I know a place that's trouble-proof up on the roof. Who sang that? The Drifters, good. Somebody, and uh, Carol Keane as well, who was born Carol Klein. I like her version, I must confess, the best. But interestingly, in many ways, it kind of typifies the church. When this old world starts getting me down, I know a place that's trouble-proof up on the roof. And almost, it's like an analogy of the kind of 21st century church. We're up on the roof, we're doing our aerobics, our women's studies, our men's studies, but keep us away from the mess in the street. And we're looking towards heaven, just waiting on Jesus and his holy helicopter to come to take us home to heaven. (laughs) Theology is not like that. And those texts in Isaiah were talking about faith spilling in to conflicted spaces. And so as clergy leaders in the Irish context we had to ask ourselves that question. Does church continue to remain up on the roof where it's trouble-proof away from the chaos and the mess and the dirt and the sectarianism and the racism and the bigotry and the anti-Semitism of the streets below? Or can those ancient texts spill into those spaces and make a difference? In the mid-1980s, we put together a publication called for God and his glory alone. And you may ask me, Gary, like, why did you use that title? Well, because people on the pro-British side who were pursuing political violence or terrorism were using the phraseology, for God and Ulster. All right. Those on the pro-Irish and the IRA side who were using terrorism and political violence to bring about a United Ireland were using phrases like for God and Ireland. God's not Irish. He's not British. And trust me, dear Americans, he is not American. (laughs) Because Paul says quite clearly that my citizenship primarily is in heaven. He says that very clearly in his text. That while I may hold a British passport, an Irish passport, that my prime identity is as a citizen of the kingdom of God. Northern Ireland's a very, very tiny space. Just 1.6 million people during our conflict. But over that 30-year period, we had 47,000 people injured with 36,000 shootings, 22,000 armed robberies, 30,000 people went through our penal system 
with 16,000 bombings and almost 4,000 dead. And that tiny population, and I often, for American audiences or congregations, extrapolate those figures into your space. So very simply put, if our civil unrest that lasted for 30 years had have taken place in the US, population-wise, you would have had 700,000 dead, 6 million political prisoners, 9 million injuries, 7 million shootings, and 3 million bombings. And people often ask me, Gary, when you're not in the United States or working in the Israeli-Palestinian theater, what does your main work in Ireland look like? It's legacy. It's dealing with the past. It's ensuring that a fragile peace process doesn't unravel. Because at the root of our conflict was toxic politics and toxic religion, where we were able to demonize each other in the name of God. And that passage, three passages that were read to us in Isaiah, talk about what I call the politics of healing. To ask can theology facilitate a politics of healing? Because sectarianism in my space was a a way of life. It was an absolute sectarian cockpit. And so I ask you this morning as people living within the United States, that you need to ask yourselves what cockpits are alive and well in the United States today? And can theology spill into those cockpits, whatever title you may want to put upon it? And so Isaiah, writing millennia ago, wrestles with these questions. And he actually brings about what I call a kind of uh, theological, a pastoral process, and it's sequential. There is a sequence to it. There is a thought process in it. Because in the first reading, in those chapters 1 to 39, what Isaiah does and asks us to do, he does a socio-economic and political critique of an unjust society. So when people say about politics in church, I don't do politics in church as regards uh, Republican rallies or Democrat rallies or in my space, Ulster Unionist rallies or Sinn Féin rallies. But it's the role of the church to critique an unjust society. Because it's the role of the church to shape the outer space. So in those first chunk of chapters, the first 39, read them, Isaiah critiques what he calls an unjust political society. And in the second chunk of verses there from 40 to 55, chapters 40 to 55, he names the pain of loss. He names catastrophe. He names trauma. He processes what we call a community's hurt and a community's displacement. But he doesn't leave it there. Because the thing about theology, it's meant to give hope. And in the final chapters from chapter 56 onwards in Isaiah, the prophet does what is called a release of imagination. Talks about a new beginning, a new future. But if it's going to be theologically based... It's got to be rooted in inclusion. It's got to be rooted in justice. It's got to be rooted in peace. And what Isaiah is saying to us that we need not always to read the Bible through what he calls a kind of individualistic mentality. That everything is centered on me. As one writer of another generation said, God made man in his image and we have returned the favor. So what we simply do is we remake God to look like us. God is a white, European, middle-aged man like me and I have remade God in his image. And extremists theologically across the globe do that. Be it in my space, in your space, in the Middle East, and in South Africa, as we were talking about early. People remake God in their particular image. 
And so a writer commenting on that said, while we can read the Bible within the individualistic framework, we need to be careful that we don't push aside a number of these texts which basically are community texts. So I'll give you a classic example. Uh, Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. I know the plans I have for you to give you a future and a hope. That was not written to one person. That was written to Israel. It was a community-based text. And yet we have this ability to individualize every single text to me. And one uh, young woman who's a theological blogger says that too many of us uh, sophisticated 21st century Westerners suffer from what she calls a Disney princess theology. Now, it's okay our kids on Christmas morning waking up with a magic wand and putting some tiara and we take videos or iPhone photos of them. That's quite fun. But if we bring that kind of mentality continually into our Christian life, it is fundamentally wrong. Because invariably what we do in Scripture as we look at Scripture, it becomes about me. You know, I'm Peter, never Judas. I am the woman anointing Jesus' feet, never the Pharisees. We are the Jews escaping slavery. We are never Egypt. The Pharisees. A group of the religious elite of the day. Jesus clashed more with the religious elite of the day than he did with anyone else. So I said everybody, including me as a religious leader, always beware of people who put themselves as the religious elite and don't spill out into the public space. And one of Jesus' encounters, again in the public space, was with a Roman centurion. Let me contextualize that, because unless you read the Bible contextually, you miss the point. So Jesus is a first century Jew. They are under occupation by the most efficient military machine on planet Earth, namely the Roman Empire. So think of that. I mean, the kind of jackboot is on the neck of the Jews. And Jesus engages with a Roman centurion, the absolute enemy, the other. And how dare you, Jesus, come out with a statement, I have not seen so great a faith in all of Israel. You're talking about our enemy. You're talking about the oppressor. You're talking about the persecutor. And you're saying this centurion has a greater faith than all of the theological experts who have been studying the texts for millennia. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. How do you reconcile that? Because within our faith, too many times we want this, what I call, theological predictability. We don't critique theology. And it's absolutely crucial to critique theology and the way we do theology. And that is what Isaiah was doing. I mean, all of us within this building know today that religion has been responsible for some of the most toxic acts of hatred on planet Earth. I remember a number of years ago speaking in York, St. John University, northeast of England, and this uh, young uh, Japanese professor in her early 30s was talking about a topic I knew absolutely nothing about called Shinto nationalism, which simply was the rise of nationalism within certain elements of Japanese society. But the one thing I do remember from this young woman's lecture was she said this, an incomprehensible act becomes comprehensible when told in conjunction with religion. An incomprehensible act becomes comprehensible when told in conjunction with religion. So how many groups in your space, in my space, in other spaces tell me that God is on their side and not on the other person's side? 
As you look at American politics at the moment, uh, Jonathan Sachs uses that uh, word linguistic violence where literally in your space, fellow Christians are verbally assassinating one another theologically. I mean, the first hymn we sang there today, I mean, through every line of it, was asking about unity, about humility, about togetherness, about engagement. And then we wonder why people don't want to come to church. Most 20s and 30s say to me, Gary, I am looking for truth that is lived. I want to see it lived out. But as you read your newspapers, you must ask yourselves, why has theology become so toxic within your space and within my space? And some of the work I'm trying to do in the United States at the moment is asking people to press the pause button. Both Republicans and Democrats, particularly people of faith, and to ask yourselves logically, what is the most important thing in life? I was doing a lecture Tuesday week back along with Republicans and Democrats at the Carter Center. Uh, the, the Republican there, who's a friend of mine, Leo, very conservative Republican, doesn't make him a monster. Trust me if you're a Democrat. I stay with Republicans here. I stay with Democrats here. Most of them are pretty normal kind of people. So I think you need to ask yourselves the question, what is happening in your space that has allowed it to become so toxic? And let me kind of just move slightly away from theology to psychology at the moment. Jonathan Hyatt is a social psychologist. He's an atheist. But he wrote an article uh, recently, and he opened it up talking about theology, talking about the Tower of Babel and the confusing language. And obviously then he took the comparison from the Tower of Babel, spilled it into the American context and said, why are we not hearing each other? But he quoted a study, hear this clearly, called the Hidden Tribes of America. This is what he said. Social media, okay. Sometimes good, sometimes absolutely toxic. And he referred to a group called the Devoted Conservatives, okay. Very right of the Republican Party, of which there are just 8%. They are responsible for 56% of social media posts. 8% of Republicans. Democrats, sorry, you're worse, okay? 10% of Democrats are responsible for 70% of social media posts. And so I'm asking the question, along with other Republican believers and Democrat believers, where's, where's the center ground in America? Where are people like yourselves who come to church regularly, who serve God faithfully, where is your voice in the public square? And thankfully, a number of churches and other faith-based institutions are not trying to change Republicans into Democrats or vice versa, but they're trying to say, what is the most important thing in life? And in that, I've simply said this. Politics is temporal. The gospel is eternal. I can tell you categorically, politics has never revolutionally transformed or changed my life. In fact, I probably confess over years of toxic politics in the Irish context, it's changed my life in a way that has changed me how to think politically and to move away from violent rhetoric. But I'll tell you what's changed my life profoundly is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because that is actually eternal. And that is what lasts. And I ask you and I ask myself, what value system do I want to give to my kids? Do I want them to hate the other, teach the Irish Catholic to hate the uh, British Unionists and vice versa? Is that the legacy I want to leave with my children? And I said this in this lecture in the Carter Center 10, 12 days ago. I told them stories, you know sometimes you look back at your school photographs, you know, when you say, well, they're dead, they're dead, they're dead. I went to an old boys' school, and I can look back at a photograph of us as teens, and a third of them are probably dead, 
because of toxic politics and toxic religion. Because as young boys, 15, 16, and 17, they listen to their political masters or their theological elites, and they took up the gun to defend their particular constituency in the name of God. So I asked this group of Americans that were tuned into that, is that what you want for your 15 or 16 or 17 or 18 year old kid? Is that what you want to give them? Is that gonna be their life script, teaching them to despise and verbally assassinate another person? Because like it or not, for all of us in this building today, no matter why you're a Republican, Democrat, or other, each of us are made in the image of God. You know, God's fingerprint is in my head, it's in your head, it's in your head. That is factual. And that's what politics can do when it goes wrong. Teaching you to hate a person who's made in the image of God. And so what do we do using texts like Isaiah and others? We brought people together. And maybe this is something Trinity could think about. Maybe Stephen Catherine will curse me forever for suggesting this, but now that I've been on the sentence, I guess I better finish it. Should you create a space where Republicans in this space and Democrats with a good facilitator humanize each other? Why should you do that? I've been a student of the Holocaust or the Shoah all my life. Uh, my uncle Jimmy, uh, who was a World War II veteran, whose funeral I did when he was, died at the age of 82, bought me a book as a 12-year-old. You kind of go like, what a book to buy a 12-year-old, but he did. It was called The Scourge of the Swastika. And just looking at how Nazism, and particular Hitler, who was not exactly a kind of observant Catholic, but Hitler was clever enough Hitler, like many political leaders, used religion in a poisonous way. Here's what he said in the second chapter of my camp. Today I believe I'm acting in accordance with the will of the Almighty Creator in defending myself against the Jews. The first question is, how do you know, Adolf, you were acting in accordance with the will of the Almighty Creator when you never ever even darkened a church door? But he was clever. So beware of any political leader who uses theology and uses religion to teach you to hate other people. Some of my friends are dead because of people like that in my space. And trust me, we don't have a monopoly on people like that. Let me tell you about another leader who you all know, Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin wears a gold cross around his neck. His mother was a Christian, his father was an atheist, he was secretly baptized. Putin, in recent months, has commissioned a cathedral in Moscow where he has asked for a picture of him, Joseph Stalin. Now, Stalin murdered between 9 million to 60 million people. This is a Russian Orthodox church. As well as pictures of other great military leaders. Putin is a practicing Russian Orthodox person. And as I mentioned in the previous service, when Ukraine was being invaded, despite all the lies, they're having a military exercise. I know your administration, the British administration, the Irish administration, the European Union were asking, what the hell is going on on that border? And eventually swept in. And we all asked the question, Kiev, Kiev, why Kiev? Why, what's the deal with Kiev? Is it because it's a capital? Is it some geopolitical significance? No, it has religious significance. And here's why, in 988, long, long time ago, another Vladimir, Vladimir the Rus, R-U-S, which obviously the name Russia came from, converted to Christianity and insisted that every person living in Kiev was mass baptism in the Depna River. There and then, the Holy Mother Russian Orthodox Church was born. And that's why Putin said recently, the Belarus, Russia, and the Ukraine, that is 
the Russian Orthodox Church. In 2019, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church broke away from the Russian Orthodox Church. So it is a religious war in total? The answer is no. But there's toxic religion playing about there as well. There's nothing wrong with being a Russian, Irish, British, Israeli, Palestinian, American. There's nothing wrong with those identity. But when you combine identity with ethnicity, with theologies of superiority, it becomes absolutely toxic. So that's why people like you and people like me need to critique American politics and need to critique British politics and Hungarian politics. Where I read the other day, there is now a bust in the Hungarian parliament of a Nazi collaborator. If we're not critiquing that, who is critiquing that? Let me just finish with a final story. Put your hand up if you had a relative served in the Second World War. Grandparent, uncle, whatever, okay. Stacks of people, okay. okay. My uncle Jimmy, who I mentioned earlier, I did his funeral at the age of 82. Uh, him and my grandfather, this, this is my uh, church experience, Stephen Catherine, I never told you a story. So my granda fought in the First World War, was severely injured against the uh, Turks. He had a hole in his head that literally a small boy could have put his fist into. And like most men, he was pretty vain. So my early uh, boyhood memories were sitting with my grandfather on the outside of the pew, tiny Gary in the middle, and my uncle Jimmy here. I was stuck between these two military men. But my grandfather used to reach down to me every Sunday. He had a lot more hair than I had, I can tell you that. And he said, uh, Gary, is my wound covered? And if it wasn't, as a little boy, I'd have sort of ruffled his white hair and made sure this hole in his head was covered. He was still self-conscious of it. So they kind of military marched me to church continually. And I was saying I was preaching at church in Fayetteville when I told this story before, and not dissimilar to here. Lots of hands went up. I say categorically, unashamedly, I am immensely proud of my Uncle Jimmy. I don't know any of your relatives, but I'm immensely proud of them. Why? because they destroyed the most toxic system of Nazism that has ever existed on planet Earth. But I do say this. Be careful when people try to use politics in a toxic way. Let me just talk a second about January the 6th, Epiphany, and the Capitol building. And I've said this publicly, if you're a Republican here, you have a total right to demonstrate. Within a democracy, there is no issue at all in relation to that. That's what democracies are for. Peaceful protest. But I did struggle when I saw people at that demonstration with t-shirts on that said, Camp Auschwitz. When I saw other people at it that said 6MNE, do you know what that means? Six million Jews were not enough. And I can tell you this categorically, I don't mind if you're a Republican or Democrat, uh, our closest friends in Orlando are Republicans, solid, decent, Christian people. Uh, when we leave here tomorrow, we go to other friends in Orlando, they're Democrats. They're solid, decent Christian people. But I'm telling you categorically, my Uncle Jimmy and your relatives did not die for some idiot prancing about in front of the Capitol building calling for another Holocaust. The church needs to call that out. Why? What created the Holocaust? Toxic theology. Read, if you want, Gabriel Walensky's book, Six Million Crucifixions. And what Hitler did basically was take thousands of years of Christian anti-Semitism religiously and flipped it into racial anti-Semitism and paved the way for the Holocaust. So the church needs to be above politics because politics is temporal. The gospel is eternal. And as I said at that last service, um, the uh, hymn you were 
singing there with kind of blends of uh, it is well, it is well with my soul. There is a brilliant version of that by the Nashville Singers, if you want to Google this uh, when you go home, uh, looking at that whole hymn. But there is a line in it. Uh, It's a number of different singers, uh, very Alcapulco the way they do it, where this African-American guy sings that verse where it talks about the final curtain falling on planet Earth. The phrase in the hymn is, the sky will be rolled back like a scroll when Jesus finally returns to planet Earth. And all of us in this building believe eschatologically that that will happen one day. And I know this factually. And if you disagree with every single thing I've said up to now, it doesn't bother me in the slightest. Someone more Oz Guinness once said, if Moses had have taken a straw pole in the desert, he would have been in bother. Um, so in relation to that, if you disagree, that's fine. But you can't disagree with this. When the final eschatological curtain falls on planet Earth, and one day it will, it's not going to be Joe Biden, Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, Ronald Reagan, Barack Obama, Margaret Thatcher, Boris Johnson, Angela Merkel, or Vladimir Putin standing on that stage. One person called Jesus Christ. And all those politicians will realize this. They were simply two-bit actors in a drama produced by another person called Jesus Christ. So I'm just asking you as a church, and I can say this from experience, as someone who lived through 30 years of bloody, barbaric, dirty, sectarian religion and conflict, you don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. We've had 4,000 suicides in our space since our conflict ended. It's over, but it's not over. So I ask you as a church unashamedly, no matter why you put an X against a Republican or a Democrat, Put your biggest acts against Jesus Christ. And ask, what would Jesus do in this toxic, messy space politically of the United States at the moment? And I think he'd be saying, bank on the eternal. Disagree well, understand well. But remember Trinity Church. Your citizenship primarily is in heaven, not here. Amen. said before we go to the table we're going to share together in a creed it's the world methodist social affirmation creeds help us to say what we believe Um, we, we say what we believe they also remind us what we believe and encourage us to move forward with what we believe to live out what we believe. So I just want to invite you to stand for a moment and we're going to say this together. It's a responsive creed. We believe in God, creator of the world and of all people, and in Jesus Christ. Why don't we say this together? Just say the whole thing with me. We believe in God, creator of the world and of all people, and in Jesus Christ incarnate among us, who died and rose again in the Holy Spirit, present with us to guide, strengthen, and comfort. We believe God help our unbelief. We rejoice in every sign of God's kingdom, in the upholding of human dignity and community, in every expression of love, justice, and reconciliation, and in each act of self-giving on behalf of others. In the abundance of God's gifts entrusted to us that all may have enough, and in all responsible use of the earth's resources. Glory be to God on high and on earth, peace. We confess our sin, individual and collective, by silence or action, through the violation of human dignity based on race, class, age, sex, nation, or faith, through the exploitation of people because of greed or indifference, through the misuse of power, 
in personal, communal, national, and international life through the search for community by those military and economic forces that threaten human existence through the abuse of technology which endangers the earth and all life upon it. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. We commit ourselves individually and as a community to the way of Christ to take up the cross, to seek abundant life for all humanity, to struggle for peace with justice and freedom, to risk ourselves in faith, hope, and love, praying that God's kingdom may come. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. You may be seated. Each week as we come to the table, we are reminded that here we celebrate God's kingdom. Here we remember God's kingdom. Here we strive for God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We come to this table and we remember that God came to us in human form in Jesus Christ. And the very first thing that Jesus did when he began his public ministry was go into the temple and open up the scroll from Isaiah, from Isaiah, and remind everyone of the politics of God, the politics of the gospel. Jesus said, I have come to bring good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, God's favor and goodness on all people. And then Jesus lived that out, and it infuriated all those around him so much that he was put to death. And yet he willingly gave himself, he gave his own life that we might truly have life. We remember that on the night before he died, he, he embodied that for everyone and for the disciples as he took a loaf of bread and he broke that bread and he gave it to the disciples and he said, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and again he gave thanks to God and he said, this is my blood, my love poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we come, we come to this table so that we can be strengthened and fed and then go out into the world as a living sacrifice, go out into the world emptying ourselves, losing our life that we might gain eternal life in Jesus Christ. And so we give thanks to God that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Let's pray together. Oh God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. May they be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we can go out into the world as the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. And by your spirit, we pray, O oh God, that you will make us one. That you will make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes. Christ comes and stands at the heavenly banquet feast where all are welcomed into eternal life with Christ. It is in his name and by the power of the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. So this morning, again, we will uh, return to uh, serving communion as we did prior to COVID. So let me invite the servers to come forward. And as they do, I will remind you that in the Methodist church and here in Trinity, the table's an open table. Everyone is welcome to come and receive of this feast 
given to us by Jesus Christ. It's a place where we can receive grace, we can be forgiven, and we can be strengthened to go out and be a courageous witness in the world. So there will be some ushers and they will guide you and you'll come out the left side of your row and to the station right in front of you and you will receive a piece of bread, take that bread and eat it and then you will receive a cup and you can drink that and then place your empty cup in the basket up here at the front. Then you'll return by the other side and you can always spend as much time as you like at the kneeling benches in prayer either before or after you come. So as the uh, servers move to their stations, um, we invite you to come as well. Everything is ready. Please come.
Let's pray together. Oh God, we give you thanks for this meal, this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us and we pray that we can go out into the world and lose ourselves for your sake, that we can empty ourselves so that we can be filled with Christ and share that love with the world. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. And again, I just want to thank Gary for being here with us and for sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with us. And let me just tell you that at the first service, the sermon was different than at the second. So if you want to hear him twice, just go online and you can go to our YouTube channel or there's a podcast on the website and you can hear the first sermon and then you can... You can hear a different sermon than you heard this mor- at the second service, both equally wonderful. Um, so now let me invite Gary. I'm just smiling there because Joyce says to me, why do you do that all the time? And I say, I actually get bored listening to myself. <laughs> you know, it's fun. Let's just for a pray. Final thing there, uh, Schindler's List, the movie. Uh, Joyce and I placed uh, stones on Oscar Schindler's grave. He's buried in uh, Jerusalem, as many of you know. But in that movie, a fellow Irish man, uh, Liam Neeson, is talking to the Jewish man, a survivor, and he says, he who saves one life, it's as if he saved the whole world. So be saviors of the world individually. Let's pray together. Gracious God, help us to be saviors of people's lives, not in that redemptive measure, but through grace, dignity, and understanding. Help us to be a people in this church who overcomes difference, diversity, and brings all your children into your glorious eternal kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.